uh, we showed up and we had no lines written. Which actually freaked me out so much because I'm very much used to a script. Equally, I got into it and I was like, <laughs> oh dear, we should have written some lines for this situation. Life is like a roller coaster, but it's so much better when we go through it together. Welcome to the Candace Cameron Bury podcast. We are in a special series with members of the Smallbone family. In 2023, I got to co-produce, well, executive produce, and play a role in the movie Unsung Hero, which is the incredible true story of the Smallbone family coming to America from Australia that hits theaters this April 26th. These bonus conversations Conversations go deep with Rebecca St. James, Joel and Luke Smallbone of the band for King and Country, and their amazing mom, Helen, the true unsung hero of their family. We're also answering a lot of listener questions in these episodes together, which just might be yours. And today I get to sit down with Joel Smallbone of For King and Country. Joel is an Australian actor and one half of For King and Country with his brother, Luke. Together, they have won four Grammys. They've generated over two billion streams. I mean, 10 GMA Awards, a Billboard Music Award, an American Music Award. They've performed on just about every show like Good Morning America and The View, which is where we first met. The Today Show, Tonight Show. Joel has been a part of several films, uh, including his first acting role alongside Billy Ray Cyrus in 2014 in a Nashville-based film like A Country Song. I wanna hear about that. <laughs> and it was followed up by an independent film called Priceless, which he co-wrote and played the lead role in. And I believe it's streaming on Great American Pure Flix. And last Christmas, Joel was in the movie Journey to Bethlehem that you might have seen opposite Antonio Banderas. Now, Joel co-wrote, co-directed, and starred in Unsung Hero. Joel, welcome to the podcast. Yay! That was quite the epic <laughs> intro. Candace, I'll pay you later. Well done. Well done. Well, it's all your accomplishments I get to brag about. That's kind. Our accomplishments. Which Unsung Hero is one of those? It is. Yeah. We've had a fun friendship over the years. I've so mm. enjoyed getting to know your entire family. And I talked with Luke a couple of uh, weeks ago. Yeah. And we we did share how we met, but I still think it's a fun story. I like to hear it from everyone's perspective. <laughs> oh, yeah. It... it uh... <laughs> It's a dramatic, uh, you know, it's funny how so much of our journey has been kind of um, circling each other, I feel like, mm -hmm. uh, because even down to, there was a Christmas um, Nashville televised event That's that right. you did. And I was so, this, so this is before we have, I think we met briefly that night, but yeah. I, it was like, this is, this is Candace Cameron. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was very uh, sort of fear and trepidation. Um, and man, it must have been like 2014. It was, it was a, it was I a remember it. Yeah. Um, and then the, the official meeting was your 40th uh, birthday. birthday celebration yeah. on The View, which is crazy because I'm two months away from my 40th. <gasps> you are. I am. Welcome June, to the June club 5th. almost. Yeah. It's exciting. 40s are great, by the way. Um, I don't know. Are you scared? Yeah, how's or the are water? You, it's, it's, are you, is it fine? Yes, it's Good. great. It really is. Except that you start to like, you wake up some days and you go, why does this hurt? Yeah. <laughs> I've actually, I don't know, my body's sort of preparing for 40. I felt yeah. that like the last couple of weeks I've woken up and been like, this is tough. <laughs> yeah. Getting up right That's now. That's kind of my biggest complaint. However, I feel like with every decade, you get more confident yeah. and comfortable in your own skin. And I love that. I would say from the outside looking in, even from the time I've known you, from that mm -hmm. brief interaction in 2024, The View and onward, I feel like you're, you're the best version of yourself Thank now. you. Thank Living you. I your appreciate best life. that. Um, yeah, so, okay, The View. Uh, okay. These are my snapshot memories. I remember being in a New York hotel room the night before uh, rehearsing a glockenspiel part that I, with a glockenspiel in the room, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know what that is, sort of like a xylophone instrument, uh -huh. um, till like 2 a.m. I remember um, 
you know, obviously it was sort of, um, it wasn't a full surprise, but the, the particular surprise was your daughter mm -hmm. um, performing with us yep. live on television. I also remember being arguably more nervous that day than I had any day prior with a live performance or since. Why? Partly because of the glockenspiel, because I didn't quite know my part. Yeah. And then partly because um, it's there's something about live television. I mean, you're a pro at it, but like anything you say, anything you do, it's forever documented. Yes. yes. And, and, and there's no going back. You can't undo it. You can't uh, delay it. Mm -hmm. It's just there. Mm -hmm. And so there's something that can really trip you up in your mind. Um, yeah. Totally. So, yeah. I also, I mean, being, that was your first time on The View also right. as it well, was. right? It was. So to me, I mean, that in itself is like, obviously the show is so, so popular, but because of politics on it and all of that. Like yeah. I was so happy when they surprised me with you guys because you were my first choice. They asked me who some bands were that I really liked yeah. and you were the number one on the list. So I was shocked that you guys were there, but then I just thought, Oh my gosh, we get to like, we're singing about Jesus yeah. on, on well, national that, television. That, that was, that was, what was so, so exciting. cool as well is that we were singing this song priceless and we're singing it with Natasha and just the representation having a, a, a woman sing this song with us mm -hmm. about the rise of women, about woman, a woman's worth, mm -hmm. celebrating you as a woman stepping into this, what I think is your greatest, boldest decade yet. And then you fast forward to today and we're, we've been able to, you executive produce and act in and sort of lead the charge with us yeah. on a film about two powerful women, our, mm -hmm. our mum and our sister. And so yeah. uh, it's funny how our journey has kind of been from the beginning, from the get-go, uh, it's been this sort of uh, lift of uh, yeah. rising, raising up women around us. Yeah. yeah, it's so cool. We also had one other, I was so happy. You called me one day, dear Candace, I can't do your accent, Joel, but- um, Dear Candace. <laughs> You asked me to be in one of your music videos, Joy. Yes. And that was like, yes. I, it's like a, it's a dream for a wannabe singer because right. I can't really sing. And to be in a music video was so exciting. And it was such and a we great danced. song. And we did. For the record, I think that's the only music video <laughs> to date that we have ever danced in. Um, and it was, you were so eager and as eager as you were, Luke was equally terrified. He's he like, told me, he's like, I'm a terrible dancer. Like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> um, no, and, and I remember too, again, speaking of being daunted, like I remember showing up and we do, we do music videos. I've done a little bit of acting here and there, but you know, you've spent a lifetime acting. And we got in and we were like, we had this vague idea of how we were going to start the music video. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, we're going to, you know, talk. It's like this newscaster, sort yeah. of the evil newscaster, the doomsday newscaster, if you will. And, and, and I'm trying to keep things positive and joyful. And, and we showed up and we had no lines written. <laughs> Which actually freaked me out so much because I'm very much used to a script. So it was like, we're just going to improvise this. And I was like, okay, yeah, great. And then yeah. Equally, yeah. I got into it and I was like, oh dear, <laughs> we should have written some lines for this situation. Someone threw us a scrap piece of paper and, and a pen. We started jotted jotting it down. things down. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was great. Yeah. What, what a cool, it's rare to have um, such a ranged creative uh, friendship and yeah. collaborate, like from, you know, a political show yeah. to a music video and now to a feature length film in theaters. It's, and, and it's such an incredible movie. I can't wait to talk about it a little bit later on the podcast. Right. It's, it's truly one of the highlights of, of my career, mm -hmm. honestly. And I, but we're going to, we're going to talk to you all about it because moment, it's about you and she your family, but it's pretty incredible to have, be a part of a movie as significant as this movie is mm -hmm. and as powerful as this movie is to have a theatrical release yeah. that I know is going to change families' hearts. I feel very blessed and privileged to be a part of it. So thanks, well, thanks for asking, friend. We equally feel honored <laughs> to have you. We really do. We're going to start with some listener questions. I love listener questions. 
Bring bring them on. This one's a little, it's a little tough. Okay. Let's go go for the nitty gritty right off the bat. Tina would like to know, what's your favorite movie? <laughs> oh, Tina. <laughs> So I'll, I'll give you the bonus round here, Tina. Before For King and Country even existed, our, one of our favorite things to do growing up was to make short films. All mm. of us as brothers. Luke could never remember his lines. And so he was, we'd, you know, we would actually write scripts for these short films uh -huh. and, and we'd get into it and he couldn't remember his lines. So we'd be like, man, just, just kill him off, you know, kill the character because <laughs> he can't remember his lines. But we loved, we loved movies growing up. Um, we did bad spin-offs of Indiana Jones and created our own little worlds with these, with these, uh, you know, these, these bad short films. Mm -hmm. And so equally we studied film, um, growing up. I have sort of a top five of favorites. Um, I'll say in no, in no specific order, um, Jurassic Park, the original. Okay. And I dare say the only good one. So, okay. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> Um, Gladiator. Oh, so good! What a what a marvelous yeah. what a marvelous piece of filmmaking on every level. Um, Braveheart, mm -hmm. you know, just classic. Um, Shawshank Redemption. Mm, yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. uh, that's all. I'm giving you four. You're giving me four. Yeah, those are all really powerful movies. Yeah, and very dramatic. I think and very a, dramatic. And my favorite movie, and I'm going to go to childhood. Yeah. The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I've never seen it. <sighs> that, that hurts my heart. I know. I'm sorry. It hurts my heart. What? How have you never you seen the, the you Wizard can, of Oz? You can stop the podcast now, everyone. <laughs> I'll leave. I don't know if we can be friends anymore. I know. Mariah has been, uh, there's a lot of films that I've not seen. Wow. I haven't seen Grease. Sorry. <gasps> Wait, that's, Sorry. that's the other one. It's Greece. Sorry, You've never Travolta. seen it. <sighs> Even not supporting my own if country If they were going to do another Greece, how many were there? Three, maybe? I mean, we know, like, I was not oh, I into, I was wasn't into the second one with Michelle okay, Pfeiffer. Now, and for the record, I did. So we have the Franklin Theater in Nashville uh -huh. where we live. I bought tickets for Mariah to take her on a date a couple weeks ago <laughs> to watch Greece, the original. And we just were too tired. <laughs> Speaking of turning 40 Brilliant. this year. So we're like, Brilliant. no, we're just not going to do it. No, if they were going to reprise another Grease movie, I would like you to play the lead. You would be I receive it. the perfect person for that movie. You've heard it here first, uh, you everyone. Have. I'm so, I'm putting it out there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We have a question from Miriam. Speaking of acting. Great name. It is great. Miriam. Name. Yeah. From... Uh, there's a woman in Braveheart named Miriam. Was it Moses' sister, Miriam? Or was it, it was an M name? Let's say it is. More, okay, never mind. I don't think if it's If it's Miriam, not, it's put close. it in the comments. It's not. <laughs> it's not. Okay, it's close. Okay, but Miriam would like to know, um, how, do you, how do you access emotions when you're acting? Like, how do you mm. switch so quickly? And- did acting come before music? I'm kind of guessing that it did with all the short films you guys did. So, sort of. I mean, I, I've, always, I've always approached um, art as kind of expression, right? Mm -hmm. Like a song is a certain expression. Mm -hmm. um, being on stage, interestingly, writing a song versus performing a song on stage is a different expression. Um, uh, you know, thespianism acting is, 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 is a different expression, but I've always seen them as sort of linked pieces to the same sort of concept, if you will. Um, I, I have tried, I think throughout and, and to say I have a career as an actor is generous, but I have tried throughout for what it's worth my career as an actor to, to pick roles. And I've been very fortunate because of music to be able to pick roles that I just felt innately connected to mm -hmm. you know i mean the i don't think you could feel more connected to the role I was say, in unsung yes. hero because you play your dad i, play dad. In the movie. I have i have very publicly dubbed it a a very expensive therapy session um and and an apt one and and one that i will be forever grateful for and um that's a great example of tapping into emotion is i think you've got to try and eliminate how long at least for me the bridge is from reality mm -hmm. 
to the screen. And so playing your dad is the shortest bridge you can possibly, I feel yeah. like as a son, you can possibly create where you just go, man, I'm bone of his bone, flesh of his yeah. flesh. And, and I've known him every minute of my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so to be able to step into his shoes was actually really in, 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 in all seriousness, it was very therapeutic for me. Like there was a very clear before and after. I'm sure it would be. Right. I, I do have a question about that. Did you play your dad in the way that you saw him as a child or did you play him in a what way a that you um, just wanted to see him played out, you know, no. as a character that you created in your mind? That's such a good question, Candace. I... Because I experienced the story as a child. Yeah. And so you would think the simplest thing to do, just, okay, I'm going to just eh, take what I felt as a child mm -hmm. um, and the way I perceived him as a child and mirror that back. And I, I actually chose not to do that. I, on the contrary, and this is why it was important for me to actually co-write the script, was because I felt I needed to go with Richard Ramsey, the screenwriter and co-director. I needed to go deep into his psychology as a man and actually see it if it's from the, you know, from a child view up to a parent, see it from a parent down to yes. the child. And, and that's why it flipped everything on its head for me because I've only ever approached this journey as a kid that was just shy of 10 years old, moving continents. Mm -hmm. And now to go from a father, you know, from a, a man's point of view, I'm roughly his age, mm -hmm. you know, in the film and to go, man, what's it like? to move continents and have the responsibility of six kids and your wife who's pregnant and have no insurance and sleeping on beds made out of clothes and can't get back to Australia and all of the sort of perils and pitfalls that you face, like it just kind of rocked my world. And I, I realized I've been so lazy with his story um, mm. growing up because I always just approached it like a kid, like it was this adventure. It was great. And now as an adult to yeah. go, man, the stress and the strain and the struggle it gives such great context to those, those things that I've been lazy with of just going, you know, so easily with a parent, you go, I don't know why you act this way. And then, and then yeah. you drop into their story and you go, oh, yeah, well, maybe that's why. Did you come away with a different perspective of your dad while writing or even more than or performing? What do they say? There's 18 inches between the head and the heart. I think in writing it was all head knowledge mm -hmm. and that had shifted. But in, in presenting it and performing it, it made its way down that 18 inches from the head to the heart and, and, mm -hmm. v and visibly and viscerally expressing these things on screen. It was a heart change for me. There was a, there was a before and after for me yeah. in my relationship with dad. Yeah. That's so cool. I can't even imagine how, I mean, from the out, from looking from the outside, you guys are such a close family. Yeah. So I can't even imagine how much more either appreciation or love or whatever adjective you would want to say the difference of what that is for your dad after having gone through the experience of making this oh, on screen. Yeah, the empathy, be, the mm -hmm. empathy that I feel empathy for him now is is very different mm. than it ever has been. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well. We have another question from Shelly. Give it to us, Shelly. Yeah, what Shelly do you got? asks, do you ever burn out from all of the pressures, the expectations and roles that you have to play in everyone else's lives? Uh, because you are, you're a husband, you're a right. bandmate, you're right. a producer, you're a right. director, you're a brother, you're a son. You've been on the road much of your life and with all of, all of your family as well. Yeah. Uh, I've always, Shelley, been very workmanlike with my role. And music is a funny thing because as opposed to movies, music, you have to be all things to all people all the time. You're the writer. You're the performer. You're the producer. You're the director. You're, 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 mar you're the marketing team. You're the social mm -hmm. media guy or girl. You're all of it. Yeah. And I sort of liked that. Like, it, that's how we cut our teeth. We, before Luke and I even stepped onto the stage, we were always behind the stage with our sister, Rebecca and James, doing stage managing and, and, and running lights and set up and tear down. And so we have this real holistic view. 
And there was something very safe about that. There's also something very safe about doing it together. And then you step into movies and everything is so delineated, right? Mm -hmm. Every role. And so it's funny because people are like, how did you, you co and you directed and you play? And I was like, well, this was just second nature. I felt the most natural stepping in and going, yeah, well, I'll write the thing and then I'll perform the thing and then I'll help orchestrate the thing. Like that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so it felt very natural. I'll say this though, I felt, and I'm, I'm sure you can relate to this, Candice. I, the stress and the strain of carrying the load of such an enormous project mm -hmm. with a film, mm -hmm. with a theatrical film. Um, and then also feeling a level of vulnerability in that Luke and I in the band, everything's split. So it's always like, we're in the interview together. We're on stage together. We're the co-writers together. We're like, it's always us. And there's an interesting thing that's happened even with this film. It's like, yes, he's a producer on it. He's a key part. The band's a key part in it. But our, like our roles have sort of delineated a bit with uh -huh. like, but I'm the director. I'm the, I'm the guy on screen. Like Luke is on screen for a moment, but like, the, so uh, I have had to face um, even the last month or two, a level of, um, a terror might be a strong word, but of like, oh my goodness, we're stepping, like growing pains at least, we're mm -hmm. stepping into something, I'm stepping into something that I need to be really fortified. Even on a spiritual level, I, I felt um, a layer of like attack. And I don't say that lightly. So how do you deal with that? Like, what do you do with that? Um... Are you familiar with like low frequencies and high frequencies? Basically, low frequencies are like primal frequencies, like fight or flight. Mm -hmm. You go to resentment, you go to, you know, attack. Yeah. Uh, high frequencies are the more sort of, say, <laughs> let's say spiritual, you know, you, you pull people in, you go to prayer, you know, mm -hmm. to being still, leaning on in your own understanding. Uh, you know, initially, I actually think I went to um, very kind of low frequency, like gunslinger blow stuff up sort of thing. <laughs> right. And then by the grace of God, uh, I, I think I've, I've gone into this more, this being, and there's room for it all, by the way, there's no shame. That's what I've realized too. Mm -hmm. Going to this place of staying in more of a like, Hey, I'm not a, like, I'm not alone mm -hmm. in this thing. You know, um, I don't know. I have to shoulder this thing on my own. I have a bit of a rescuer savior complex coupled with a little bit of a control freak thrown in. <laughs> and so if I were to self-diagnose, and so those things, while in many ways have served me well, in moments where you're either being attacked or whatnot, yeah. you can tend to feel like you have to shoulder the burden of the whole thing mm -hmm. on your own. Yeah. And the realization of going, man, if God is for you, who can be against you? One, but two, there's incredible people, yourself included, that are mm -hmm. like, not just idly standing by, but are like showing up and are team. You've got this incredible team. Yeah. This powerful team. Um, and yes, you might be pushed, being pushed out in front for, for me in a way that I'm not quite used to. It, it doesn't change the fact that you can lean on these people around yeah. you. So it's been a real great exercise in, excuse me, in, in leaning on other people. Yeah. Which also, because I, I, you know, some people are listening, they're going, it's great. You have a team because you're a musician right. and you're an actor and Candace, you have your podcast and you make movies and you have a company. And yes, I, I couldn't do it without my team. However, right. Unsung Hero is a beautiful example of your family being your teammates. Mm -hmm. So I don't want that to feel like for the person listening, that's like, well, I don't have all the, those types of things. Right. That um, well, and there's also a flip side where someone could say, Shelly, maybe you even say, like, hey, I'm I'm actually I just don't have a team like mm, or in mm. your case, I would say for you, like, yeah, you have a team, but it's still your name on everything. Like, yeah, no one's going to the next guy or girl. If there's a problem, they're coming to Candace if there's a problem. Right. And that's the thing I feel a little bit on this is like, yeah, like I'm. <laughs> I'm out in front on this one. Yeah. Um, and I th look, I think that the truth is that's why community is so important. Yes. That's why local community. So even if it's not biological community or family, local community, church community, people of brothers and like people around you, you have to build that because mm -hmm. otherwise you might be able to survive on a good day. But man, when, when the crap hits the fan, <laughs> you got Yeah, we lean. weren't made to do life alone. Amen. Oh, no. No. Certainly not. And yet so much of today... I feel like is, is, is like, is sort of faux 
um, intimacy, like social media. Mm, yeah. It's sort of one side. You can say whatever you want. You can put it out. You can be angry. You can be joyful. You, you can put it all out there. But that that level of proximity it, where, where we're sort of creating loneliness, it seems, by the extra layers that we're putting in between us and other people. So it's a, it is an interesting time, even to, to, to highlight a film that's in the 90s, which was like the last era before like internet and smartphones and all the rest of it. I know. Yeah. I know. Did you know that over 85% of grass-fed beef sold in the U.S. is imported from overseas? Yeah, I know. It's a staggering number, isn't it? That's why you need good ranchers. They're the number one source for 100% USA-grown meat you can trust to feed your family. Instead of getting overpriced imported meat at the store, Good Ranchers can deliver the meat for your family straight to your door. It's easy to switch from the grocery store to Good Ranchers. Right now, subscribe to any of their 100% grown in the USA meat boxes to secure my special offer of free chicken for a year. Yep, they're adding over two pounds of their fan favorite pre-trimmed chicken breast to every order for a year when you subscribe and use my code CANDY. Go to GoodRanchers.com and use my code CANDY to claim over 25 pounds of free chicken today. GoodRanchers.com, American meat delivered. Okay. Corporal says. Corporal. Corporal. Not a great name. I know. Uh, Corporal says, I have a friend who's mad at me. I truly don't remember doing what she said I did. I apologized. I even told her I missed hanging out with her, but she won't forgive me for whatever it was that I did. Right. So my son says I shouldn't worry about it because if she's willing to throw away our friendship over something small, I should just walk away and let God deal with it. So my question is, how do you emotionally get over it? Wow. <laughs> you get it's these, so hard you get, to be Do you get these questions a lot? Is this what you're dealing with? Oh, lots. So many, all wow. kinds of questions. And yeah. we have, we have viewers and listeners from like age 10 to age 80. And it's amazing yeah. the questions come, that come through. And Well, Corporal are very profound and bold and um, humbling question to put forward. I know. For it's sure. kind of hard to put yourself in someone's shoes with yeah. the exact um, Well, situation. first of all, I'd say, actually, I think your son, you know, there's some wisdom there mm -hmm. like that was my first thought was going you are only responsible for your own side of the street yeah and there's only so much you can do particularly if you don't remember what you did like and that is if i hurt you in any way mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 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 sorry yeah um i will i you know i will aim to not repeat the thing i did um seek forgiveness forgiveness and seek restoration but the the, the brass tacks of life are whether it's through the season that they're walking through in life, or whether it's through, frankly, someone passing on, there are points where you cannot have resolution. It's just, it's a sad fact of the way that the human experience is. Yeah. Uh, and you have to grapple with that of like, you, the, you can live in, there might be some un, un, lack of resolution between you two, but you can still live in forgiveness and you can still yeah. live in peace. If even if Did, there's not have resolution. you gone through that personally without like naming anyone, just a con with conflict with someone that, yeah, oh yeah, that kind of tore you up, and maybe there was no resolution. And it crushed me. In fact, I, I was, I just, I, um, without going into too much detail, I experienced a, a great crushing relational separation. That ironically, and maybe this is helpful to you, I literally last night after 16 years of having to create separation mm. had, I believe, a moment of deep restoration where we were both on the same. Oh, wow. Came to the same place. And similar to, was it, was it Corporal? Corporal. Yeah, similar to Corporal, uh, there was apologies, there was, you know, but mm -hmm. you, there's a point that you have to leave space for someone yeah. in their own journey. And, and again, from one rescuer corporal, maybe to another, uh, sometimes you just can't rescue. You just got to let them find yeah. their way. I agree. I think it's a great answer. I'm not even going to add to it. 
<laughs> I want to talk about the movie. A Let's talk bit about more. the movie. Let's talk about the movie. <clears throat> I, I, I know most of the answers to this, but tell everyone how this movie came about, like right. how it came together and how did you know that it was the right time to tell this story? Yeah. Well, you do have to rewind back. I love that you have Rebecca on here. I love that mm -hmm. you have Luke on here because they're two very key figures, obviously, apart from mum and dad living the experience. Rebecca and Luke have told our family story from stage uh, for the last two decades. Mm. Uh, and they've both told it uh, in alignment with sort of a pay it forward uh, child advocacy we walk through this as kids and you can help kids around the world, uh, specifically for us through Compassion International. And we've had so many people come up and say, uh, you know, you should write a book about this. And Luke's joke is, which he probably said on his episode, is like, we were homeschooled, so we don't read and write very well. <laughs> he did tell that <laughs> yeah, joke. Yeah, of course he does. <laughs> and, 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 but we'll, we'll sort of make, make a movie, if you will, which is hilarious because let me just say, it's much easier to learn to read and write than make a movie. <laughs> if by chance we couldn't read and write, which we can for the record. Of course. Um, and, uh, but, but so in, in 2020, actually in the height of the pandemic, we were on a, drive-in tour, mm -hmm. you know, where people stay in their cars and you sort of perform on a stage and you'd pump the music into to their FM Wait, radio they, system. How did I not know those existed? Yeah. Wow. We did one in the parking lot of the Rose Bowl right here. In wow. Fact. We did 60 drive-in shows that year. Oh my goodness. And um, we were in like Omaha, I think. Uh, Luke had called a producer friend, Steve Barnett, and he'd said, hey, what if we just start putting pen to paper on this idea of our family story? Mm -hmm. So he literally flew out the whole, a lot of the family flew out and we met in this like Hampton in um, like boardroom masks on socially distanced, the whole thing. And we basically broke the story. And I remember Richard Ramsey that day saying, he turned to dad and he was like, Hey, I'm, I'm really sorry that you had to go through this. And then he sort of turned to the rest of the table and he was like, but what a great film this could make. <laughs> uh, because wow. the, like the, the key moments that you experience in the movie were so real to life. Yeah. Like even David's speaking of 40th birthdays, mm -hmm. his 40th birthday, um, he genuinely got let go that day and walked straight into a surprise birthday party. Mm -hmm. Like all of these key moments were not fabricated. They weren't even really adjusted. They just kind of were what they were. Yeah. And so we went into about two years of screenwriting. And frankly, we, we approached the story from a thousand different directions. It was dad's story. It was mom's point. It was story. At one point. It was mm -hmm. Rebecca's story at one point. And then simultaneously, we were working on a new album and we wrote this song, Unsung Hero, without the film in mind at all. And one day we were on a conference call about the movie because we were grappling with a title. And we'd sort of decided on the call that we were going to write it a bit more from mum's perspective. Mm -hmm. And it, almost like a lightning bolt, it was like, guys, we have a song called Unsung Hero. And we have this movie that's mm -hmm. built around mum. Why don't we just marry the two? Yeah. And, and, and from that day on, it became. Um, it became unsung hero. That's incredible. Yeah. And then it was a journey to put all the puzzle pieces <laughs> together. And I'm so grateful that you included me along in that journey. Yeah. And I have to say for the record, let the record show that. So those producers that I mentioned, um, they, they were going to finance the film and mm -hmm. as musicians, we, our schedule was planned out for years. Yeah. Um, We'd released that new record with Unsung Hero on it, a, a record called What Are We Waiting For, our fourth studio album. And we said, uh, although we'd released it in March, we said, we're not going to do a full tour this year. We're going to cancel it because we're going to make a movie, uh -huh. which is a million dollar risk, a multi-million dollar yeah, year risk yeah. when you do all of the mathematics. We said, we're, we're not doing a full tour. So we backed ourselves into this like scheduling corner and then we worked on, radically worked on the script, Richard and I, to get it to a place that we felt really good about it. We felt great two months or maybe three months at best before the production, uh, the production house had to move on to another film. Like they, they had to pull their funding back uh, because they'd, they'd, they'd gone in a different direction. And so we like were sitting in this boiler pot moment where we were 
two or three months out from going into production. We had no funding. Mm -hmm. We had no actors attached. And uh, it's we a were devastating sort of blow. Devastating. <laughs> And so the first call that we made <laughs> was with Kent, was with you. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually out of the country at the time, so I wasn't on that yeah. specific call. But we had, we just knew that a, a bunch of guys telling this story was really kind of frustrating. And, and we, we, so you were the, actually the first uh, great voice from a woman's perspective to come on, which was massive. And then um, you just bringing this beautiful credibility that you've spent decades um honoring your audience and honoring you know tv and film and 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 sort of pe making people feel so seen um for you to come on and lend your name to this that was such i've said it to you before that was such uh that rose the whole thing to the point that then we, we could go to investors mm -hmm. and we could go to different actors and say, would you be part of this? You know, Candace has come on an executive producer and she's acting in it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that was sort of, you were the, the first positive penny to drop uh, in, in then a, a list of three months worth of miracles yes. that led to the production. I know it's yeah. incredible. And I can't, I can't wait for everyone to, <laughs> to watch this movie. Yeah. It's just, it's, I keep saying it's so good. It's so good, but it is, it's just, a, it's a powerful story. Mm. Um, tell me, is there anything that any part of the story that you wanted to tell that didn't make the cut or maybe you even filmed, but didn't yeah. make the editing cut? Um, there was a couple of things that we couldn't do on the script level that we had to cut mm -hmm. ironically it was the miracles mm -hmm. we sort of put in there were so many miracles that happened when we first moved to the states and we we sort of jam-packed so many of them in and you know this very well in filmmaking that it actually started feeling like um have you ever heard the phrase jump the shark mm -hmm. okay sure it's this idea that there was this literally there's this film i don't know what the film was specifically but like where the, you, you sort of were founded in reality. And then at some point, I think this bloke actually jumped over a shark and it completely broke any sense of reality in the film. And, and it, it, then the film as a result really suffered. And so this phrase, jump the shark, was basically anytime you do something in a movie that um, sort of betrays belief. Yeah. Um, and, and we had so many miracles that it actually started feeling unbelievable. Wow. So we had to sort of like actually peel back <laughs> some of the very real to life That's things that incredible. happened because it just felt, it didn't feel, it, it started feeling uh, sort of like a fairy tale versus actual like honest filmmaking. And so that was one on the script level on the scene. Well, just tell me one of the miracles. Um, one of them specifically was we would pray in that prayer circle. We would pray for everything, you know, and it was very visceral prayers. So we would pray like... One of the prayers was for uh, checks to cover our bills. Mm -hmm. And like some weird magic trick out of nowhere, we would have a, literally a check that would come in the mail and we would do the math and like the check would cover the bills by like $8 or something. Wow. Where like you'd put the math, it was like, you know, it's like a, we, need, we needed 1,200 and you know, $58 and the check came in, it was $1,250 or, or, or $64 yeah. or whatever, yeah. you know? And so there was stuff like that, that in, in real life, you're like, this is just the act of God. But in filmmaking, if that check, check showed up and you sort of looked at it, you'd go, well, that's just, that's unrealistic. That's unrealistic. Yeah. So that, that's that was so one cool. really, and then, and then in the film itself, <laughs> there was this day where, um, we were filming one of the characters, musicians in the film is a guy named Carmen, um, this artist, mm -hmm. we call him the Italian stallion. And we had this great actor come in who looked exactly like Carmen. He owned him, uh, owned the character. And there was this whole um, scene uh, with the gentleman from Happy Days, his, his name slipping me. And it was the three of us. And it was when we'd moved to the States and David basically gets fired. Dad gets fired from the job that he'd moved over for. Mm -hmm. And it was this whole elaborate scene. Um, and uh, behind the camera, what was going on was uh, Mel Gibson had actually showed up on set that day. And again, one of my favorite films is Braveheart. <laughs> Braveheart. 
<laughs> so here I am, you know, sort of putzing around as this Australian, you know, director actor, and I'm, I'm here with the guy that arguably inspired me to think that I could direct and act mm -hmm. at the same time because he directed and acted and starred in yeah. Braveheart. So I went up, I didn't, I didn't want to bother him too much, but I went up and said, Hey, I just want you to know, like part of the reason I felt like, you know, I could even step into this film was because of the inspiration of seeing what you did mm -hmm. as a director, as an actor. And he's made this comment. He said, he said, you know, he said, Oh, Joel, it's just, he said, it's, it's so much more about, uh, perspiration than preparation. And I was like, okay, that actually made sense to me because it was just, at this point, yeah. it's all about perspiration. Yeah. But we did the scene and, and, and I just was so in my head that I, I stayed out of my head most of the time, mm -hmm. but it was this real, like David was so upset because he was being fired and he just brought his six kids over. It was like, you know, we've got no bloody beds and he slams the thing yeah. down. And I was just so in my head the whole day. I don't think that's why the scene got cut. Maybe it did. Um, but yeah, there's a whole scene there that got plucked out of the film. <laughs> Thank you, Mel. <laughs> it happens uh, in all great movies. Sometimes yeah. they, they, they can be great scenes, but they just don't make the cut. You got to right. keep the, the story moving forward. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. We're going to take one last listener question. Let's go. Cause our time is coming to an end. Yeah. And this is from Angela. She says, she asks. How do, how do you recognize what your purpose is? <sighs> I know. We actually, Angela, Angela we did good. a whole season on finding your purpose. It's season two with Heather mm. McFaddy. And so you might want to go back and listen to that whole season uh, if you haven't already. But Joel, any words of wisdom in, in recognizing or finding your purpose? It's a, it is an incredible question. And an incredible age to ask that question and an incredible country to ask that question in mm. because this is, you know, this is the pursuit of happiness and, mm -hmm. and, and this is free enterprise. And this is like so many stories that throughout human history, you were never able to actually be an immigrant and rise up out of I immigrant status or, or based on the, your gender, the color of your skin, w be able to actually flourish in life. And so it's an incredible question to ask. Um, I can only speak from personal experience and say, be careful of the lightning bolts. We want the lightning bolts when it comes to purpose of like, Framo, that's your purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it was never that. It was this slow and steady build into what my purpose was. And it was very malleable. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite verses is we make our plans, but God orders our steps. Like absolutely make your plans, Angela, but make your plans, but give enough room for your steps to be ordered and configured in a way that you might not think they should be or could be or in the way or the time or the place mm -hmm. that you think is best. Um, so I would say that number one, beware, you know, beware of the lightning bolts. It's just a slow burn. Um, and then secondly, I think it's all about the focus of what a dream is, Right. Really search your heart, you mm -hmm. know, that other prayer of like, test me, know my heart, um, is this idea of like, am I, is this an outward dream or is this an inward dream? And what I mean by that is I think if, if you're aligned with God, it's always an outward process. It's always this thing of like dreams will give back you know, mm -hmm. and having others in mind. That's where the beauty is. I'm like, I feel like you approach this similarly, Can Candace, in that we see ourselves as public servants, as mm -hmm. artists, yes, but mm -hmm. we're serving mm -hmm. the people in many ways. And so make sure whatever those desires and dreams are, are outwardly focused, because if it's just, it's, if it's just ambition, selfish ambition, hey, that can drive you and you can even succeed. But the fruit of it, I think you'll find mm -hmm. when you get to the other side of it, I just don't know if the fruit is going to be what you thought yeah. it would be. Yeah. So, Make sure the dream is always to serve something, someone greater than yourself. Yeah. Because that's actually where I think true joy and happiness is found in the end. I totally agree. And I, mm. would, I would simplify everything you said. Mm. I completely agree. And I would say that in finding, helping find your purpose is asking every day. Yeah. How do I, how do I glorify you, God, today? That's good. That's good. And that truly can help you find your purpose because 
It's the focus whatever shift. your yeah, whatever your interests are, whatever the things you have to do are, mm. um, whether you have a family, you don't, or you're doing your job. How do I do it? How do I do my my job or my life with purpose? And my purpose is to glorify God in that. Yeah. Upward and outward. Yeah. That's good. Love that. Okay. Before we end this, is there yeah. anything else you want to share about the movie? Even if it's a takeaway of what you hope people will walk away from mm. seeing the movie? I really love that. The whole point of art is to mirror back to people what they might be going through in their own experience. And we've mm -hmm. loved that as musicians to be able to write these songs that were very personal, but they're mirrored back. And people say, I see myself in this song. It met me in this moment when I was walking through this thing, relationally, vocationally, spiritually, and it was an impact. And I love that with filmmaking too. And I love it that it can hit people in different walks of life, mm -hmm. um, different places in life, and um, so with Unsung, fathers are seemingly wrecked by David's journey, which I take such pride in. Yeah. And, and in a beautiful way, like they're moved to want to be better dads or husbands yes. or work, you know, at their job um, in, a, in, a, in a different way. Mums are feeling so seen, which I think yes. is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I take a lot of pride in that too, as yep. the son of a powerful woman. And even teenagers and young 20s with Rebecca's character, like so many young girls are going like, I'm trying to navigate, like, who am I designed to be? Who am mm -hmm. I meant to love? What mm -hmm. am I meant to do? What's my story in this life? And, and they're seeing in Rebecca. And so I love that pe different people in different walks of life, different ages are taking so much away from it. I think the only thing I would close with is just a charge, you know, yeah. is that um, we're at a really beautiful but pivotal point with this type of film, mm -hmm. you know, um, particularly in the theatrical experience, part of the reason we wanted to release it theatrically is we wanted people to come together for this film. We wanted families to go out and make a night of it together. And we wanted people to experience it in a way that is really an event mm -hmm. because we felt like it is an, it is, the film is an event. But um, the difference between music and movies is with music you have years to promote an album and with a theatrical release you you know this better yeah. than anyone can is you have 72 hours yep and so you know april 26th uh which you know we're dubbing family day you got mother's day yes. you got father's day we dub it family day if you plan on seeing the film i just say you know grab a family member a friend come out yeah. that weekend um and experience it and and i and i'll give you this guarantee if you're not entertained, oh, you're not entertained. If you're not entertained, <laughs> if you're not moved, um, find a way to get in touch with me. Drop into my DMs or yeah. send a comment and say, hey, I want my money back and I will Venmo you your money back. <laughs> uh, because I, 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 and I don't stand behind that on my own credibility. I stand behind it because of people like you, Candace, because mm -hmm. of the Irwins, because of Kingdom Story Company, because of Lionsgate, yeah. because of the whole family and the whole team and the ensemble coming together to make something that is greater than any of us could have made on our own. And, and I'm really, I'm more proud of this project than I think I have been of any in my life. Mm, that says a lot. Yeah. And the movie is for the whole family. So I've had, I've been asked that many times. So grab your family yeah. and go see the film and support, support family entertainment, support a positive word. That's all I can tell you as someone in the industry and entertainment also yeah. like, like, this is this is how we change the world in entertainment by making these types of films. But you guys need to go out and support That's them. That's right. And That's go right. see them. And then go tell all your friends. Joel, thank you so much thank for being fans. here. It was a pleasure. What a sweet moment. To find tickets for Unsung Hero and watch a trailer, go to unsunghero.movie. And if you want my current unwind guide about emotional health, go to candace.com where you can also ask listener questions like the ones Joel answered today. Until next time, be grateful all day, every day. Candy Rock Entertainment, all rights reserved.